From this point of view, um, I just briefly introduced due to a Phoenix research infrastructure, which is the basically supercomputing uh, uh, infrastructure uh, on which the Human Brain Project relies. Okay, and this is a, an infrastructure that uh, relies on uh, five supercomputer centers: one in Barcelona, um, Switzerland, Lugano, uh, Ulic, and Cineca in Italy, and in France there is a, another one. Uh, so far. Um, access to these resources is only through the CSCS system, which is the uh, Swiss supercomputer center. Um, who has already worked with supercomputers here? One, it's okay. Nobody. Good, because the, the tools that we have in the platform will let you use these resources uh, without any kind of competence on parallel processing, okay? Because the the, the programs, the, the, the code is already optimized, it's already installed on the supercomputer, so you need just to point and click, okay? Uh, even without having your own account on the supercomputer. This is something different from the HBP account. The HBP account will uh, let you um, um, access the platform, but still you need an account on supercomputers to run your, your, pro your programs, okay? The tools that uh, are in the, in the brain simulation platform, you will see they already have a pre-configured supercomputer access even without an account because we, we have a, a organized um, a thing called uh, um, service account, which means that uh, we have open a given amount of resources to everybody to access through the, the platform uh, supercomputing uh, um, resources and allocations. Small, but still useful to do an initial uh, work. So, uh, so far I told you that uh, uh, only the Swiss supercomputer center uh, could be used for, for to access this, uh, these resources. Uh, you see there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of nodes and a lot of uh, uh, computing cores. Um, so, how you can access this infrastructure? One, through Human Brain Project. You need to be a, a PI in the Human Brain Project to access this resource, so you cannot, do, you cannot apply on your own. But you need to go through one of us uh, and do a collaboration on a science, a scientific uh, issues. From this point of view, uh, you, also, I, um, you may be aware that uh, there is a call from the Human Brain Project called the voucher call. Um, if you go on in the, the internet and look for uh, an HBP voucher call uh, 2019, uh, you will get access to a, a way to begin to use the, the infrastructure and the, the, um, and, the, um, and the platform in a more uh, specific way. Uh, so, or you can access the platform, the, the Phoenix infrastructure through Praise. So now Praise is not for beginners. Praise is an organization that uh, gives uh, access and allocation on, based on tens of millions of hours to do large-scale modeling, okay? So I don't think that at this stage, if you are doing this course, you, you can deal with this kind of projects. But still, eventually, if in your lab, in your institution, there is someone that is willing or needed some um, large-scale uh, model to run on supercomputers, we can, uh, we can uh, collaborate on your, or, or you know that you can go through via praise. And, um, well, for uh, HBP is much more easier because we just um, send an application, it is reviewed internally, and if it is technically sound, we will get the, the, the allocation that we need to, to do um, the, the, the job. Just to give you an example of uh, the amount of allocation that you would need. In order to run your own uh, um, optimization of a single neuron, you may need how much? About 1,000 1, hours? 1,000 core hours, so it is a very small application. In order to run large-scale models of entire brain regions, you, you need an order of, uh, um, for each simulation of one second, uh, you are going to need about uh, half a million hours. Okay, so it is going to have a, a wide range of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of application. And I think uh, I'm done with this, and uh, uh, if you have any question before we start with the actual course, I will be happy to answer. If not, then who is next? Yes? Have you sliced available somewhere? 
I can give it to you, yes, no problem. Or we can put it in the, in the website or um, through education maybe, yeah. Okay, who is next? Luca, for the, the infrastructure. Yeah. Take it out. You can have this in your back pocket. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, that's fine. So good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Luca Bologna. I work in Michele's group, and I mostly work on the design and the development implementation of um, some of the services and the tools that we are providing in the brain simulation platform. Uh, the brain simulation platform provides a large set of tools to, uh, to build, reconstruct, simulate, and uh, analyze um, models, uh, data-driven uh, brain models. And um, it is accessible from the Human Brain Project website, which is the humanbrainproject.eu website. You just uh, go through these little panels here. You have a brain simulation. And if you go down here, you have a direct link to the brain simulation platform. So the brain simulation platform is integrated in uh, what is called the collaboratory of the Human Brain Project, which um, can be seen as a sort of a collector of workspaces where all the work that we are doing in the Human Brain Project, uh, our partners, all the people working on there um, is, is, is being put. So you do your, your software, your model, data, whatever, and you create your workspace in order to share your work and collaborate with collaborators and partners. So this collaboratory is uh, the entry point for all this work and uh, basically is an ensemble of uh, these workspaces or environments which are called collabs. Okay, so every collab, I just introduce uh, you to this because the brain simulation platform is just one of the special collabs that we have together with all the other partners. So if you familiarize a little bit with the collaboratory, you can move around easily in order to, to do your work and collaborate with, with partners. So the, this environments, these workspaces, collabs, have basically this, the same layout. So here we are in a collab which is called the Brain Simulation Platform, but this frame is common to all the collabs. So we ha you have a top menu here with a link to the home page of the uh, Human Brain Project. So this is the HPP Collaboratory Home. Then you have uh, the six special platform the brain simulation, the neuroinformatics, the neuromorphic, and so on, where you can enter and, and do your job on that topic, specific topics. Then you have some, some help that you can get from, uh, uh, from the support, the forum for, for the questions, uh, a feedback if you want to leave your feedback or uh, drop an email for any kind of questions. And then you have this, uh, this collapse link. So if you click on the collapse link, you have the list of all the collabs that have been created, which are uh, thou uh, thousands, probably hundreds for sure, um, at the moment, and also to these uh, collabs which are called platform. But most, most importantly, you can create your own collab. So if you, are, uh, if you have an access to the HPP collaboratory, you can just create a collab and do whatever HPP members can do. The only difference is that your collab will be public, which means that everyone will be able to see your collab, while HBP members have private collab, okay? But even if you're not a member and you're collaborating with an HBP member, you can be part of a private collab. You just can be invited by your, by your collaborator. So I create, on, uh, I create a collab. I will call this collab INCF 2019 BSP. This will be a public collab. 
and I create this club. There's an error. OK. So just put a comment here on the description. And this is the collab creation. I create this collab because we will use this during our demonstrations. So you can just write down the name, go to the collab and look for this name, and you can access it. And all the tools that we're going to put there. So uh, every collab has, at the beginning, these three items that works like this. You click on an item and you visualize the content of that item in the central part of the, of the window, OK, this iframe. The team, which is at the moment only me, because I'm the one who created the collab, just created the collab. Then you have the storage. And the storage is, is a space, physical space, that you have per each collab where you can put your data. Data documents you can upload, and everyone who access that collab can download that data. OK? The settings is uh, less important, but it's just where you want to change the status of the collab, whether it is public or private. And then, as a final comment, uh, you have a chat window here. So you, if you're working on a, on a collab, you want to ask something because some, something is not working, or if you have a question, you just write a message there, there, and all the members that are in, working on that collab will read the message. OK? So let's close this window and go to the actual brain simulation platform. So the brain simulation platform has different items. And we organized the brain simulation simulation platform in order to uh, be, uh, let's say, designed around what we call the online use cases. So online use cases are realistic scenari scenarios, uh, let's say, selected procedures that you can encounter while doing your research in neuroscience. So you, either it is data analysis or modeling or visualization, we thought about what the, the scientific community can, uh, can face while doing the research and we created, based on our work, this set of uh, use cases. They are grouped by um, topics and these topics, uh, topics go from, uh, let's say, the, the smaller to the bigger. So the molecular level, the subcellular level and then going up we have a, an item which is on the trace analysis, uh, uh, basically da data analysis on electrophysiological traces we have morphology analysis, single cell binding, and so on and so forth. Okay? So for every doubt that you can have on uh, a single use case, if you want to see how it works, if you have some, uh, uh, some question or you want to know some more technical de detail, please refer to the guidebook. So the guidebook is just a document, which is an interactive document with all the links to all the use cases. Which you pick up your, the use case you're working with, you click on this, and you just read how that use case works. OK, so in the brain simulation platform, you also have the overview, which is basically the introduction to the platform. So if you're a little bit lost and you, you cannot place uh, yourself anymore, just go there and find useful links to uh, all the use cases. And I just want to cite, before starting with the online use cases, this uh, folder, the models folders, which collect basically documents to the, the brain regions that we are implementing in our modeling work and in the online use cases. So these are just documents, for example, if I click on this, uh, on the hippocampus one, but can be, can be pretty useful if you want, for example, some reference to, to the um, uh, literature or the work that we are doing or you want to understand a little bit more on the work of the, on the hippocampus, just please go to this model's uh, folder and pick your, uh, your document. Okay, so online use cases. The online use cases are basically implemented in two different ways. The first one is web applications. Web application is, uh, you can think of web application as an extended website. So you have a website, you click on things, and you open other documents where you can read information. Web application is something that, that goes a bit beyond because it does some operation on the back end. Uh, typically, what you have, the, the interface to your bank account is a web application because you click on, the, on the, the login, you enter, you want to do some movement, and there's a database uh, behind that. There's uh, some 
code that do some, some, does some operation on your, on your account itself uh, so that with a single click you have some back-end operation. And the, the, very, the, the good part, point, let's say, in web applications that are very easy to use, they're very friendly, they're just point and click. The other way that we use to develop use cases is uh, Python code and more specifically Jupyter Notebooks. Have you heard about Jupyter Notebooks? So Jupyter Notebooks are just, I'm going to show you one of these, are just interfaces when you, where you, you put your code and you divide your code into cells so that you can execute single blocks of, of code, okay? Good part of this is that the code is visible so you can change it. Uh, let's say that the bad part, so the cons of this is that they're not as friendly as the web application. But of course, it really depends on the, the kind of job you're doing. Probably if you are a biologist and you don't want to know the details of the code, you will go for the web applications. Otherwise, if, if you want to play around, you want to do your own analysis and so on, you just go for the Jupyter Notebook and, uh, and play with the code. Okay? Uh, so, starting from, uh, from the bottom, uh, as I was uh, saying, we have the molecular level with two use cases on uh, uh, basically protein interaction. We have a uh, subcellular level. This has been finalized in the, in the following weeks on a subcellular um, interaction between, uh, uh, let's say, let's say what's is, what is going on inside the neuron and uh, at the pro proteic level. And we have, for example, the trace analysis uh, where you can find use cases for analyzing um, electrophysiological traces and the Rosanna, Rosanna is going to uh, show this. Uh, and also, for example, to fit uh, synaptic event in fr starting from electrophysiological traces. So how do use cases uh, work? You have the list of use, case, uh, use cases here, and all these use cases refer to the trace analysis. Let's say I want to work with the feature extraction use case. So I click on the panel, feature extraction, I accept the terms and, and conditions for using uh, that use case, and uh, um, basically now I, I want to clone the use case onto my collab. So let's say I have created um, my own workspace, which is, the, which is a collab, which is the one that I just created. I put the name of the collab and I clone this one into the collab. The other option is to create your own collab at this time. Let's say you want to start uh, from, from a brand new collab, you put the name of the collab here and you just uh, clone your use case. So in our case, we already created a collab for this course, INCF. 2019, I click on this, and I'm immediately redirected to the collab, but now, as you can see, there's, there's one item more, which is the feature extraction graphical user interface. Okay, so every time you want to work on this, you come to your collab and you start working on, on the, this web application. So, so this is a web application, Rosanna is gonna show it, so I won't go uh, through this, but I, I want to show you the, the other type of use cases that we are developing, which is the Jupyter Notebook. So the synaptic event fitting is uh, one of the Jupyter Notebooks that um, Carmen has developed. And again, I add it to the collab that we previously created. And two more items are here now. The synaptic, uh, the synaptic events fitting itself and uh, the analysis on, on this use case. So this is how a Jupyter Notebook uh, looks like. You have all the code. If you want to change something here, just go and change it. Uh, there's a nice uh, package which is called IPy widget and Carmen has done an extensive use of the IPy widget to, let's say, beautify a little bit your Jupyter Notebook if you want. Uh, so if, if I go to cell and I run all, all the cells, that basically means I execute all the code, uh, all the code disappears. So thanks to this package, this IPy widget, if you want to put some button and play around, just, just mm, proceed like this. When this circle is uh, black, this means that the, the mm, kernel behind the, the Python 
uh, Jupyter Notebook is, uh, is running, when it is empty, basically it has finished and it is almost done. I think it will take like two or three seconds more. You can choose. Okay. By default, you have Python 2. Okay, so uh, so now the, the circle is empty and you have uh, you have the, the basically the, the Jupyter notebook here. Um, as I was mentioning, if I click here, I can visualize the code again. Okay, and I can close the code. No. No. Oh no, it doesn't work. Either. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. So I have to run it again to show the code. Okay. I, I, Okay, but it was the wrong button. Okay, okay, that's that's fine, that's fine. Okay, anyway, this this is just to show you how the use cases are cloned in the in your personal collab. Okay, so we have seen the trace analysis. We have the morphology analysis, which basically at the moment has two use cases: the morphology analysis itself and the morphology visualization. The morphology analysis uh, helps you, thanks to a Python uh, package which is called um, Blue M, uh, Blue MM, thank, uh, helps you to basically analyze the morphology that you may have of your um, of your neuron. For example, you may check whether uh, every node of your morphology has parents, or the number of bifurcation, or you can just analyze the morphology to see the neural lengths and so on and so forth. Yes. I don't know if you're going to mention this later, but uh, probably it's useful to say that uh, if you are completely lost here in any of the use case, you will see this, the interactive tutorial video. It uh, will explain you step by step how to use any uh, use case. It's a movie in which you, you can interact with it. So you can make choice, choices and you will be directed to the right place to, to, to follow. Uh, yes. So basically this icon helps you understand what the use case is uh, in so the so the user the use case is intended for everybody means basically everybody so this is for example the morphology visualization is uh, point and click I'm going to open this right now this one is the level of the maturity level of the use case so beta means it can be used uh, ex experimental means it's still in hard phase of, of development and as Michele was saying if I click on this interactive tutorial, a video will open where you can uh, just see how the how the use case uh, works. We need so to be generous. <laughs> 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 yeah, there are a lot of complaints from EU about gender issues, so we need to be sure not to get to this problem. So you basically you basically um, choose the voice. Yeah. Well, I can, I'm not sure whether. Yeah. No, it's not. It, yeah. Welcome to the tutorial uh, it's, for the morphology mine. visualization tool. This video will show you step by step how to use this application. Okay. It is suggested to also read so this have, use case. You have sub subtitles and select morphology and all. And we are filling, we are basically um, filling all these use cases, so providing all, all mm, the use cases with these video tutorials. So with time you will find uh, more of, this, of these video tutorials. With respect to the morphology um, visualization, that, just to show you an example of how it works, you go through the list of models, you choose a model as, as I just did, and you visualize the morphology of that model. Okay, and you can just play around this. Okay. Of course, we don't have time to go through all the use cases, but I just want to give you an idea of how it works and how you can work with them. Are the notebooks with like Corolla and my future Corolla, is it synchronized with any changes that might happen to the original use case? Or so the web applications are synchronized because web, web applications are central. Uh, so you have a server which is running the web application and so you clone that web application and that will be up to date. For the Jupyter Notebooks... Uh, they are also synchronized. You are asked anytime you want to clone it again, if you want to have the same uh, morphology as the original, you can do that. 
So uh, going down, yes, yes. Not with not with this one. So you cannot upload your own morphology with this one at yeah. the moment. Yeah, uh, yeah but uh, maybe can, uh, can you use the the Ojkin actually you can upload your own model, but we, we will uh, see this uh, later. You can upload your own model, uh, probably you can be able to visualize the morphology, uh, but, but not with this one. But there's another, um, there is another um, app, so tool, which is called Morphology itself, and uh, you can try play around, because we, we, with that tool, uh, let's, let me see whether we are able to, uh, to add this. Okay, so let me go through. So I go to the, all the collabs. I put the name of this one. And uh, um, here in the collab, you have the possibility to add the tools that are, that are being created. So either Jupyter Notebooks, as we were saying, or web application. So if you click to add here, um, you can filter the, the tools. You have many. And I think uh, you have a morphology viewer here, add to navigation. So. Uh, you can you can upload your own morphology. So with this web application, and now you can find it in, the, in this collab, uh, you can just browse it. I'm not sure whether it accepts, I mean, which formats it accepts, whether SWC is, is working or ACS, but you can just test yours well, and, you and see where it works. You, yeah. you see that something is not fitting your needs, just send it over the ticket. Okay. And yeah. Probably in your case, this, this will work because you can read here, use the bell button to select a neuron and the example is SWC. But if you have other, other formats, just let us know. Okay, so uh, we have a, a single cell building uh, family, use case family here. Again, we have a web application, uh, a few Jup Jupyter notebooks, not only on the hippocampus, of course, but also we have the cerebellar one, we have the striatum, uh, if you're interested in that, and the, the procedure is the same. Going up to, from the single cell to the other, uh, we start building a, a circuit. So we have use cases for cell placement. The connectome cell placement is basically based on uh, uh, anatomical constraints. You put your, your <coughs> cell in a specific volume, and the connectome also based on constraints, you just uh, drive the, the connection between the neurons that you, that you placed. And one, let's, uh, once, let's say, the, the single cell has been uh, um, defined or the, the, model, the circuit has been defined, you can start with the actual simulation. I will show this use case uh, this afternoon because this is for the single cell in silica experiment. So you have one single cell and you want to run a simulation on that cell by stimulating and recording from the cell itself. And I will also show you this use case, which is the small, uh, small circuit in silico. So in this use case, we have an entire volume. We pick the cells that we're interested in, and we run the simulation. Uh, these two use cases are, um, are basically available to everyone, because you don't need HPC uh, resources. For the brain area circuit in silico experiments that I will also show you, show you because it, it is um, it is a big effort that we are doing and we want to provide the, com the community with all this work. You can simulate an entire brain area, but as Michele was saying, at the moment you need an HPC system. What uh, is the power users 
Well, power users is a broad <laughs> definition. You basically, I would synthesize by saying you have to know what you are doing, you know? Because uh, some of our Jupyter notebooks are done, uh, so okay, some of our uh, use cases uh, which have power user icon, they are Jupyter notebooks, so the, the code is accessible there, okay? But if you play around and you're, you're, you don't know basically what you're playing with, probably you, you will have useless results, you know? What do you plan that in developers? What's the difference between power user well, and the, well, developers? De developers, yeah, developers is, most, is mostly, well, it's closer to people who, knows, who know basically the, the code uh, behind. So you know, you know only the, also the technical detail. While power users is probably related to sa both science yeah, maybe, and... Maybe I can be more specific on this, because I consider myself uh, a power user, and I consider Luca a developer. So the difference is that uh, I know what I'm doing and what, what I want to do, what I want to extract from a model, from a scientific point of view. I don't care about how the simulation is actually made in parallel to run on a specific supercomputer, loading all the tools and the libraries that the compiler that needs to be implemented. They take care of this. They provide me with the simulation engines that is working and installed on, a, on all the HPC. They do the work of creating the use cases in which I can launch my simulation. But as a power user, I know what the hippocampus is what, how it is connected, what are the different population of cells, how they behave from a neurophysiological point of view, how they are connected, the synaptic transmission, what, what kind of model in terms of uh, synaptic plasticity they want to use, all this information. Um, if, I, if I know how to manage all this information, I am a power user because I, I also know some coding in which I can implement my, the, 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 the simulation independently of accessing the platform or not. I can, do, I can run my simulation also by accessing directly the, the supercomputer and run my code there. But I don't know how to implement or how to install uh, the neuron in parallel to run on that computer. I don't know if it is, this, is, this is clear. Yeah, and also these developers tasks, they are still not hidden. They are visible. There's this, this uh, thing, uh, this uh, tag developer. That's not only for developers, it's that for all, for all the, the use cases. They, they just like, be the tag developers. Right? So, when you see here power user, it means that you need to have some experience. No, I mean the tag developers, it's not hidden, it's just, it's not only for developers of this. No, sure, no, sure, no, sure, it's, sure. For, it's for everyone. Users yes, that yeah. Can Play around, sure. This gives you an idea of the entire use case. So, of course, the, this does not prevent you to click on the use case. It's just to, to say basically what we think the expertise of the user should be. It's mainly uh, for the users. For the developers, they have another collab mm. platform. Oh. Okay. Consider it that just as a warning. Mm. If you enter that use case, you need to know what you're doing. Otherwise, I mean, you can still run it, but the, the results may not be meaningful. Mm -hmm. And how are the Yes, yes, we uh, basically go through um, a process which is developing and then testing uh, and then putting the use cases into production. So, so we test ourselves, of course, then we have a guy who's working at EPFL, Alexander Dietz, in, uh, in the Jean-Denis Coucault's group, and he's doing all, the, uh, we call them uh, Selenium tests. So it runs all the tests with all possible configurations, and clicking on the button, etc. And if something doesn't work, of course we are going to fix it. But uh, if you find a bug, please let us know so we can. Yes, if you just go here to the contacts, to the contacts page, and you want to drop us an email, uh, so here, here, basically all the links. We have this GitHub issue tracker uh, where we put all the issues. So you, you can also insert an issue there. You just need um, a GitHub account, which is freely. Uh, accessible. You have the forum to the platform, and then just write as an email at BSP. Uh, there's support if, if you want to ask something. And each use case is supposed to have a developer's names next to it, so you can run directly to the developer. So that use case. 
Yes, we are filling this field. Uh, you have, for example, for this one, you have the, the email. So you want to, if you want to directly contact the, the developers, just write, write to, to him. Uh, but uh, what our suggestion is just go through the BSP support because BSP support is a, is a ticketing system. So um, everyone is reading it. And of course, given that this is a collaborative work, if, even if the developer is not there, but someone else knows what is going on for that use case, someone will, will uh, answer your, your email. Okay, so basically we are done with the use cases. Uh, the, this highly integrated uh, workflows at the moment contains uh, one of the use cases that we observe here also in the, in the, um, in the single cell building. And uh, basically, um, <coughs> highly, in highly integration means that, uh, as Michele was, was saying, uh, data-driven um, modeling, collection of data uh, analysis. So work done by different group groups is put together into single use cases. Uh, so, I have five minutes left and I want to just cite a couple uh, of um, items more. So, so, the online courses, which is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, online courses, maybe you have heard about MOOC, these massive open online courses. Uh, there's a very famous platform which is called Coursera and there's another famous platform which is called uh, edX. And these are platforms that offers uh, online courses and uh, some, in some cases also certificate if, if you want to, uh, to register for that. So these uh, online courses here refers to online courses that are available on the edX platform in neuro, uh, computation neuroscience. So if I click on the uh, MOOC initialization here, and uh, for example, the first one, the reconstruction simulation of neural tissue, I have a link here, the link to the course and if you click this link, uh, you are provided with the page of the course itself. So as you can see, this course is provided by the EPFL. It is about uh, simulation neuroscience. Uh, you have all the information that you may need. You have the, a video here where, where the speakers uh, uh, present the course and say uh, what the course is about. Okay, so all the, all the guys who participated to, the, to this course. And uh, uh, with respect to the brain simulation platform, basically here you have all the exercises that are linked to the, the lessons during the weeks of the course. So the, the principle is the same. I clicked on one of the exercises, then I, I can again put our, our collab. And also this exercise, which usually is a, a Jupyter notebook, uh, is cloned into the club. Okay, so the, this, uh, this cloning uh, procedure is basically repeated for all the tools that we are developing. And finally, the last item that I would like to present is um, an item that is called uh, live papers. So live papers is um, uh, basically a a place where we are putting the links to all the scientific work that we are actually doing related to not only the brain simulation platform but let's say the human brain project in general. So here you have a list of papers uh, which are grouped by, by ear and you can uh, click on, uh, on one of them. Let's say we take uh, this one, the first one. You can click on, on one of them and you have the useful information uh, that you can use to, for example, download, uh, download the paper, read the abstract of the paper. You may not be interested in the paper or you may be interested in the paper, so you, you, can, uh, you may want to have a look at the paper itself. But what is important in the live paper is that, so we call them live because they not only provide information on the paper, uh, not only, let, let's say, they provide information that you can read but it also provides all the links to basically all the data that have been used to write the paper. So this paper was about uh, the physiological uh, variability of uh, channel density in hippocampal uh, cells. And of course, to do this job, we used more different uh, morphologies, electrophysiological traces, so we build the model, we run the model, and so on and so forth. So all these data are accessible through those, these links, for example, if I open the morphology and I, and I want to 
download the morphology, I can, but also given that the idea is that we connect all the tools that, that we are developing together, I may also want to view this specific morphology which is referenced in the paper and have a look at it. And this is uh, this holds true also for um, the other data. For example, a nice um, interface is for the electrophysiological traces. So we use these traces to optimize the model of the paper and uh, I can select uh, a segment of this trace and uh, every trace in this case has two signals. One is the, the stimulus, the other is the uh, the recorded uh, voltage, um, uh, mem membrane voltage, and here I have it uh, displayed. I can zoom it, for example, if I want to zoom on a single action potential and so on and so forth. The, 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 corresponding, I mean, data, the corresponding data for the paper is not stored in the collab. It can be any somewhere else. It is, well, it, it is um, downloadable. It is not stored in the storage of the collab, but it is in, uh, stored in public containers. We call them containers, which are public, so, so available to everyone. So you will not have access to the entire container, but of course you can download the data here because they are free. And when you download them, would you automatically get some information on, on what sort of animal this was collected? Well, it depends on how the data are stored. I think in this case, they are the raw data. So you don't have the metadata, but um, we are providing, for example, for, for the models in the brain simulation platform uh, here in the, um, so here we have a model catalog. So we are collecting all the models that we are using. In the model catalog here, you have the list of all the models and there you have the, the description. Then of course, you also have the option to, to write the, uh, the people because sometimes the metadata are, are elsewhere. And then um, I, w I would like also to cite that the Human Brain Project provides a, an interface to all the data that is being built that is called Knowledge Graph. So if, if you go to uh, humanbrainproject.eu and you look for the Knowledge Graph, you can start to explore all the data there. So most of the data are already in the Knowledge Graph. Putting data into the Knowledge Graph goes through a, a, a curation process. So you analyze the data, you see whether they are fine or not. So you, uh, you may have there some data that you, you cannot find elsewhere or the other way, way around. Okay, so. For the models, here you have all the informations. For the light papers, you may not have the information, but you have the reference to write to, to people. And for the knowledge graph, basically, you have all the information altogether. OK, I think, uh, yes. Does MATLAB include source code that can reproduce the function? It includes source code. Uh, in, this, in this example, we have the refer a reference to ModelDB, which is a repository for, uh, for models. It is called ModelDB. It is not part of the Human Brain Project, but it is a freely accessible platform. So if you have a model, you can just put your model there. Uh, were you referring to the model to, to the code to do the simulation or to do the optimization? To, I don't know, the code that reproduces their findings, I'm not talking yeah. about the model. I'm talking about the, how they run the, the model, model that reproduces the experimental data. Let's say that. Yeah, okay, so this is available in the model to be. Okay, so all these papers are about models only. In principle, yes. So uh, by, by now, all journals accepting uh, models, uh, pro uh, the authors must provide a link to where to download the code to reproduce the model. I mean, if some paper is not about the modeling, but some like useful stuff, source code, it's not, it's, it's not, it should not be included in, in this list, right? Well, this list is, uh, is uh, the, 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 the light paper <coughs> is something in which you have a simulation, of course, because it is a brain simulation platform. So you are not going to see in this list purely experimental. Yeah, because like for me as a developer, like model, like there's like a thing that's a model and a source code to run this model, to set up this model, to say the output of this model, where, where, are, where are these steps? Uh, say, like, how to, if I download the model, how, how to run my, like, uh, my 
my laptop, for example. So, okay, so, but these are two different issues. Yeah. If you want to run a model without installing anything, you use the platform. Because it, it, it is possible to click and run the model, and uh, you can also uh, do some incentive experiments and things like that. If you want to run the model on your laptop, this is outside the platform. In that case, you need to install whatever is needed from a specific model. This is not part of this course. Yeah. You see the difference? Yeah. Do you have the code and the model and the data before submitting? No. Of course, this is normal practice. Anyway, we, we are putting link into the live papers to all the tools that we are using. For example, with this specific paper, we, we have the models that we run, but we also use this package for the model optimization, which is Blue Pyopt. So there's a link there, and it is freely accessible on GitHub. Yeah, but uh, so he, I understand his point. I mean, he wants to download the model, then play it, uh, with, with, with play it around with it. Not, in not necessarily download on my laptop. On my mm -hmm. laptop. I, I want to play it like maybe in your, in your, mm -hmm. in your environment. It's just like strange for me that all things are packed in what you call module. Because like for me, it's like just a bunch of source code, like lines, mm -hmm. to actually run the simulation, and, and you code like a model, like a, like a, like a, a container that, that I can modify. No, no, you can. Okay. Yes, you cannot modify the, the model here. If you want to change like parameters or like kind of whatever, like simulation time or like. Yes, you can do this if you run the. the With the view space, is that? Correct? Yes. But so, for example, yeah. this is uh, this is the models that we used, and we linked this to the to this use case that we're going to see this afternoon, which is called Neuron as a Service. Okay, so this specific simulation you is going to see this in practice later. This yeah, afternoon. and in this case, you can change the parameters. But in principle, you should be able to do with the things that we used whatever you want. So everything everything is there. So in, with this use case, for example, you can uh, select the recording, the simulation, the, the, the simulation time, the amplitude of the current, the location of the current, the recording, and things like that. You cannot change the conductances or the properties of the neurons because those are part of the, of the paper. Okay. But you will see this in more detail. Yes, later. OK, so I think. Uh, I think I've ended my time. Um, please do not hesitate to ask questions uh, during the day long. And again, refer to the contacts for, uh, for any, any questions that you may have. OK? Thank you. Yeah, you can have it in yeah. the front or outside even. That's yeah, fine. exactly That's like good. that. Okay. And then, you know, you just you see it's a small. Yeah. Yeah. This way. Yeah, it's okay. Or Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not the door. Oh, no. I'm not una bottiglietta da tenere qua, non so mai cosa se, se c'è un bicchiere, sì. Mm. Mm. Casomai uso il tuo? Sì. Aspetta. Gli attacchi il coso di Carmen, aspetta che ti do, imprenderai il bel file. 
Luca? Tieni, uso il tuo, però si deve trovare sempre per Carmen, poi, perché Carmen... Intanto, grazie. Sì, questo è il problema. Sì, sì, sì. Sì, sì. Sì, sì. Sì, sì. Sì, sì. Is that okay? Yeah. Sì, prova se quello giusto. Tu perché hai detto tu al Carmelo? No, è stesso dici. Ah, ok. Allora gli rido il computer. Aspetta. Carmen? Carmen? Eh, questo lo, lo tolgo. Dobbiamo, uso il suo per ora finché non arriva adattatore e poi lo, lo cerchiamo. Se è meglio. Full screen qua. L'ultimo Luca. Non funziona. Slash. Slash. Ok. Questo va avanti. Ah, non ho spento. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Uh, today I will discuss uh, uh, some uh, um, things that we have to take into account when we manage, manage experimental data, and uh, in particular I will focus my attention on. Uh, the electrophysiological feature extraction. And uh, later I will show you practically how to use the uh, brain simulation platform and the online use case named uh, trace analysis in order to characterize, characterize from, an, from uh, an, um, the uh, experimental traces. Okay, the outline of the talk is the following. I will discuss briefly uh, the framework that is uh, um, uh, the construction of models starting uh, from the bottom, the so-called data-driven models. Therefore, I will discuss uh, the so-called Petilla terminology, uh, by which it is possible to characterize both from a morphological and uh, molecular and electrophysiological point of view, the diversity of uh, neurons. Therefore, I will introduce the IFL and uh, the, the use case uh, named uh, uh, trace analysis. Okay, uh, the question that uh, um, uh, we have is the following. How it is possible to build models of neurons, circuit, and of uh, the whole brain? In principle, uh, we work with uh, um, a specific uh, input and we have uh, the corresponding output. And it is possible to consider the brain region, the brain area as a black box, okay? And it is possible also to construct a specific mathematical function by which it is uh, possible to reproduce our target. Uh, on the contrary, we may open uh, this uh, black box. Uh, here you see an example of uh, uh, the cortex. And it is possible to construct a unified model uh, by taking into account all the experimental data, all the experimental data at different levels of uh, uh, integration. Um, it is worth studying sim uh, simple circuit uh, um, and uh, brain region that are widely uh, studied from an experimental point of view. And typically, uh, we, wor um, within the, uh, we work with the uh, hippocampus, with the hippocampus, the cerebellum, the olfactory uh, bulb. And it is uh, worth working with a small number of cells to be modeled in order um, and also with a small number of cell uh, types. The aim is uh, to carry out experiment 
that uh, are uh, and results that are uh, comparable across species. Okay, uh, in particular, how it is possible to construct, to optimize a cell belonging, for example, to the hippocampal area? Uh, what do we need? First of all, we have to, uh, sorry, first of all, we have to take into account um, um, the morphologies, okay? Typically, we have a 3D reconstruction of uh, um, cells. Uh, we have to uh, uh, characterize these morphologies from a, a biophysical point of view. This means that we have to insert along the morphology ion channels, um, ion channels with different uh, kinetic properties, and uh, there is the possibility to uh, study these uh, um, biophysical properties uh, by your own, but uh, there are a lot of data that are available in the literature. There are two possibilities, for example, there is the possibility to download here the kinetic of the ion channel from the channelpedia, or for example, from uh, the model uh, DB um, um, uh, website. Um, as a third step, we need to characterize our experimental traces. We need to uh, extract the feature. Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, there are different uh, stimulation protocols. Typically, we work with current injection. Um, and uh, when we have uh, the morphologies, the ion channels, and the electrophysiological constraint, it is possible by exploiting the Blue Blaine Python optimization li library to optimize the parameters of the model. Typically, when we work with a cell, we optimize the conductances of the ion channels, okay? But not only the conductances, we optimize, for example, also the uh, passive properties of uh, the cell. Uh, as an out output, we, uh, there is the possibility to reproduce the experimental traces. So here I show you an example of the correspondence between the experimental data and the uh, data that we obtain after the process of um, optimization. Okay, typical experimental uh, data are somat somatic traces that are uh, obtaining, uh, obtained by performing recordings at the SOMA. The input uh, correspond to step current uh, stimulation. Typically, um, for this set of data, we work in the range between minus one to one nanoampere, and the uh, um, stimulation protocol, the duration of the stimulation protocol in this case is of 400 of milliseconds. Here there is the possibility to uh, have a look at the experimental um, traces with uh, um, locally, for example, using clump, clump fit, but as we will see later, there is the possibility to visualize the experimental trace also within the brain simulation uh, platform. Okay, mm, what about the experimental data? Here I show you some uh, data um, uh, from the uh, Thompson lab at the UCL. As you see here, uh, we have a different step of currents, 0, 6 nanoampere, 0, 8, and 1 nanoampere. And as you can see, there is a great variety of experimental uh, data. Uh, there are many differences, not only in terms of the number of uh, the uh, spikes that you can see here for a fixed uh, input uh, current. But uh, for example, here uh, you see uh, the interval between two consecutive uh, uh, spikes is more or less the same. Here uh, there is something, uh, uh, a behavior that is uh, something like uh, um, a, more, uh, a Morse code uh, behavior, a startling behavior. For example, here uh, there is uh, an increase of the interspike interval and so on. So um, it is uh, clear that it is necessary to characterize this data in order to have a, a criterion. No? Um, so the same uh, for the morphologies. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there are different uh, morphologies uh, with uh, uh, different soma shapes, uh, different dendritic arborization uh, polarity. So how it is possible to take into account this uh, uh, morphological, electrophysiological uh, diversity of uh, uh, neurons? Mm, what 
Uh, it is uh, um, commonly accepted, the so-called uh, petilla uh, terminology. At the very beginning, uh, this nomenclature was uh, used for gabergic interneurons of uh, cerebral cortex, but we used this classification also for neurons belonging to the hippocampal area. And uh, essentially, um, there are three types of characteristics, morphological characteristics, molecular characteristics, and physiological characteristics. And uh, mm, I will show you um, some uh, morphological characteristics. Uh, for example, it is possible to, to distinguish between pyramidal neurons and interneurons. The matrix is different. There are some characteristics that are uh, clear, like the tipper. Uh, as you can see here, we go from low values to high values, but there are other characteristics that require a little bit more of uh, uh, knowledge from a mathematical point of view. Um, here uh, I show you the characteristic related, the electrophysiological characteristic related to the firing patterns, okay? And we will use this characteristic during the end zone session. Um, as you can see here, uh, the fine behavior of uh, the cells can be characterized uh, according to this nomenclature. There, are, there is a bursting behavior, a continuous behavior, a delayed behavior. And here uh, I wish to focus the attention between the uh, non-adapting behavior and the adapting uh, behavior. You see here in, in the non-adapting behavior there is an increase of the, uh, the there is not an increase of the interspike interval. Here, uh, instead, uh, you see that the time between two consecutive uh, uh, spikes increase. So, um, this uh, diversity from a morphological and uh, um, electrophysiological point of view characterizes neurons belonging to the neocortical regions, or, but also to the hippocampal region. And uh, I wish to uh, highlight that the same cell can exhibit a diversity of uh, um, uh, um, firing uh, patterns. So it is possible to combine together the morphological types with the electrophysiological types. For example, in the case of this cell, we have uh, the so-called continuous accommodating behavior, bursting non accommodating behavior, uh, bursting accommodating behavior, and so on. And the same for the hippocampal neurons. You see here there is a, an exemplar neuron that exhibits this kind of behavior. Bursting, continuous accommodating, and uh, continuous non-accommodating. Uh, it is worth noting that there are also physiological features that can be uh, taken into account. For example, the so-called dendritic back propagation. These data are taken uh, from uh, our paper appeared uh, one year ago. And uh, um, it is worth mentioning that when we construct an optimized model of uh, the cells belonging to the hippocampal area, there is the possibility to obtain this behavior without imposing these features, uh, this feature from the, from the very beginning. I mean that uh, we obtain the, the dendritic back propagation uh, all by simply constructing our optimizing model. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, a little. Uh, I focus the attention on the, the electrophysiological feature extraction uh, library. This is an open source uh, uh, package. Uh, it is possible to automatically extract the uh, features from time series data recorded uh, from neurons. Uh, the output uh, is uh, a file, a file JSON, in which for each feature uh, is reported um, the mean value and the standard uh, deviation. Um, few details about the code. The code is written in C++. Um, and the source code is uh, uh, public. Here there is the link um, where is uh, located, uh, um, where at which it is possible uh, to have a look at the code. So, uh, which kind of feature we have to take into account from an electrophysiological point of view? Uh, we work with the spike element features, voltage features, a spike 
shape features. Uh, a few words about the spike features, spike element features. Uh, you see here, typically we work the, with the so-called inverse first easy, second easy, third easy. Um, uh, there is, we work also with the spike count, that is the number of spike in the trace. Um, the inter-spike interval is uh, calculated in this way. We have this vector where are stored all the data. If the length of the vector is larger than one, then we are able to calculate the first easy. Otherwise, the output of the first easy will be zero. And we proceed so on. If the length of the vector is larger than one, it is possible to calculate the second easy. Otherwise, the value is uh, zero. Uh, other feature that it is worth to take into account are uh, the voltage features. Um, I wish to mention uh, the voltage base, this red line, that is uh, the average voltage during the last 10% of the time uh, before uh, the stimulus, the steady state voltage, that is uh, this pink line, the average voltage after the stimulus, the voltage deflection begin, that is uh, the eight of uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, interval uh, and the voltage deflection that is that we calculate at the end of the steady voltage um, uh, the steamed. Okay, there are also uh, spike shape features that take into account the shape of the spikes. First of all, uh, the amplitude, the AHP depth, that is uh, the relative voltage values at the first step after hyper hyperpolarization, there, there is also the AP duration half width, and so on. So what we obtain uh, as uh, output at the end of the feature extraction, essentially, as I said, I obtain a file like this, in which for each feature, uh, we have uh, the mean value and the corresponding standard deviation. And there is also the possibility to characterize uh, these features uh, uh, by changing the uh, injected uh, current. And here I report to you the spike count, the voltage base, the inverse first um, uh, interspike interval, and so on. And uh, later, uh, during the hands on session, I will show you how to extract automatically this kind of features by using the online use case uh, uh, trace analysis. Okay, that's all. Uh, spike, uh, spike, uh, take, uh, take extraction as example, but uh, uh, maybe the gathers the information. You you do you do uh, the spike sorting or spike detection for us too. The spike. Because, because I see a lot of uh, you 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 were talking about spikes. Yes. So how were they detected or sorted? Are we? The, 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 the threshold for which we. Is minus twenty. Yes. 20 minutes. Minus twenty. Uh, but the 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 Yes, from the soma. From the soma. But when you record, you record the voltage as a function of time. Yes, and there is a threshold. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, and so we define automatically from the software, we define the spike as every time that the voltage crosses the minus 20. Yes. Okay, go, yeah. Yes, yes. But I mean, in our case, we use a commercial software for spike detection and spike sorting because the spike sorting task is not that easy to. Yes, but uh, in spike sorting algorithms, you are recording from uh, an extracellular uh -huh. electrode. So you are getting not this kind of traces, uh -huh. but just some very noisy yeah, traces yes, yes. With, uh, with very small um, uh, spikes. Yes. And you don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. Okay? But this is a completely different experimental protocol. Mm -hmm. And your protocol cannot be applied to this kind of, uh, of feature extraction. Yeah. Or, I mean, 
it is again something that you can do using the platform by doing your own code mm -hmm. and trying to write a code that extracts the features that you want from your traces. Okay. Yeah. But in this particular use cases, we are going to talk about the experimental protocol in which you record from the soil. From the soil, yeah. And so you have traces like that. Oh, so, uh, the experimental protocols of square wave injection, like a lot of that is, is just from the history of physiology, people always did square, square wave injections as a way of characterizing neurons. Have you guys uh, thought about uh, or, or maybe identified whether there are other kinds of uh, experiments you could do and, and, and feature extraction you could apply that would be better? at uh, characterizing or a neuron or optimizing a neuron model at a smaller number of units of experimental time. So imagine you have a limited budget of, for each cell that you're, you're recording from of five minutes or 10 minutes to collect as much data as you can. And you want to identify the parameters of the model that that cell corresponds to as with the smallest variance that you can. It, it seems unlikely that the very best thing that we could do is a series of square wave injections. I mean, it could be. But because that's what people always did, but it seems like there might be something else. Have you guys ever ever looked into that problem? No, but it is a very good question, and then my answer is that if you really are on a very small budget, what you want to do is just spike out at yeah. spike times. That's it. You have, you, I mean, you cannot go and do a ramp, for example, or things like that, because you are going to get so so much variability that uh, from cell to cell that it's not, it's not going to be very useful. Which is, for example, let's say you give like a chirp stimulus, there's like lots of frequency components in it, so you, you get information. This is even worse. That's, yeah, you, that's, I mean, but do you think square wave is, is optimal or close to optimal? No. The zip is uh, an increasing frequency during time. Yeah. Okay? And you take a lot of time to do this. The recordings are about one minute. Right. Yeah. Because you go from low frequency to very high frequency. Yeah. And with one minute, you don't know what the cell is going through. As a matter of fact, the sentinel of experimental data that you see before, only with, uh, I think it is one second? No, less, less, uh, 400 of milliseconds. You see a drift in the resting potential yeah. during the experiment. So yeah. I, would, I would stay, if you are looking for a very quick and simple and relatively safe first approximation, I would go with spike count and spike times. But if you have better ideas, just let yeah. us know and we can implement no, it. Well, not, not yet. I just need to start thinking about this problem. Um, another question. So first, second, third ISI and, and so on, right? So there are, there are maybe some statistics that could be downstream of those. Like what is you know, the, co uh, the coefficient of variation of the ISI? Or what is uh, a functional, a, fu a fitted uh, decay constant of ISI? Yes. Right? Yeah. All those adaptation, like, adaptation, yeah, adaptation yeah. factor, yeah. Things like yeah, yeah. factor. And, I know some of those are in the feature extraction package. Yes. Some are, some are not. What do you, in terms of getting model fits that match not necessarily the exact sequence of ISIs, but the, but the, the, the dynamical type. Yes, of the neuron, that would be done. Think is most valuable. Um, uh, it, it, it depends on the kind of traces and the neurons that you are analyzing. We tested that those features too during uh, the preliminary phases of our optimization. They were not reliable. And uh, we ended up with spike times yeah. and spike count, which we, we, the, the spike count will give you the average frequency. The yeah. spike times will give you implicitly also all the patterns. Yeah. yeah. And by spike times, you mean ISIs, right? Yes. So that, ISI. You don't, uh, if you, the sequence of ISIs. If you big, you don't yes. propagate that error, right? Yes. Is it okay if you take this off at the uh, yeah, sure.
like that, and like this. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. <coughs> Okay, I'm back again. This time to um, give you an idea of uh, uh, how we do single cell models from the scientific point of view and why. Okay, because uh, I'm sure that uh, um, when you sign up for this course, you say, wow, brain simulation platform, so after that I'm going to simulate the entire brain. Of course, this is not true. It is not possible by, um, sev because of several problems. One problem is, of course, that we don't have the technology at the level of computer technology to run a simulation with, uh, of the whole brain, um, not even at the, the detailed models, using all the morphologies, but also at point neural models. We don't have a model that is close enough to the experiments to, to model everything, but also because we don't have uh, most of the data that we are going to need to implement this, okay? So why should we focus on a single neuron? Of course, this depends on the questions that we want to ask, because uh, if we are interested in uh, the biochemical pathways of synaptic plasticity or synaptic transmission, we don't need a network. We don't need a, a neuron, we need just uh, the, the set of equations defining our kinetics for our synaptic transmission and work on that. Okay? On the other side, if we want to model behavior, of course we need at least a brain area connected with that behavior. Okay? So what we can do and why we should be interested in doing a single cell model? Well, let me give you um, a, a couple of examples. But first of all, for those of you who don't, don't know how to do, to do a model, what we use to, the tool that we use to, to implement a single cell model is Neuron. Neuron is a public uh, um, open source uh, code that runs simulations, okay, of, of any kind of uh, neurons. Basically, it is a very high efficient uh, um, 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 engines solving numerically solving a large set of ordinary differential equations, okay? So basically what we do is to, to implement a neuron is to get, start from the, from the morphology and split the membrane in very small pieces and implement each piece as a set of ordinary differential equations in which we can <coughs> add any properties that uh, that specific neuron has in, in, the, real, in, the, in the real system. And then we put everything together in, as an electrical equivalent uh, system. Uh, but of course, we need to take into account the active properties of neuron. You know that the, the spike, the action potentials, is the end result of interaction of ion channels uh, that are spread all over the neuron membrane surface that open and close according to different, uh, um, different uh, timing and different uh, kinetics that generates this uh, 100 millivolt signal that is called action potential, okay? So, uh, how many of you are familiar with the Hodgkin axial equations? Okay, o yeah, okay, so you answer that. Hodgkin axial, okay. oh, you know that. Okay, so this will make my, my, my life much easier in this talk. These are come, uh, kind of the, uh, just an examples of uh, um, the, the existence of ion channels. In this case, the, it is the tunnel microscopic um, picture of uh, uh, an MDA channel which is uh, uh, open or closed. Uh, um, this is the surface of neuron. This is a, an, a model of the crystal of the of an of a ion channel. You see the clearly see the the hole that the proteins that form the channels um, between the uh, inside the outside of the membrane makes the the the, the, um, the possibility for ion channels to ions to go in and out from the cell. This is a reformulation of the logic equation. We need these equations with the parameters 
uh, given by the experimentalists in such a way to implement different types of ion channels in the membranes in such a way that we can put these equations in each compartment in which we think it is or it has been shown to be a specific given uh, ion channel. So, one, tip, one example in which we can see that the, the usefulness of, well, if you stop the air, the air conditioning, I'm going to sweat like crazy. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, one example in which you can see how useful it is to, to implement a single neuron model is uh, for, for Alzheimer. So there are a set of experimental data telling us that uh, in vitro, in animals, because of course you know that uh, the, in many cases uh, we have animal models of, uh, of diseases, epilepsy, Alzheimer, and, uh, and things like that. So in this case, there were in an in, in vitro experiment telling us that uh, during Alzheimer's um, uh, uh, disease modeled as uh, an overaccumulation of uh, beta amyloids on the, on, the protein, on, the, on the surface of the membrane, there, there is a 40% reduction in the potassium KDR channels, 60% in another type of uh, uh, potassium channels, the KAs, 50% reduction. So basically all the channels are going to be reduced because the plaques are going to stop the function of the membrane. However, they don't do it uniformly. So we can say, okay, and each of this paper was showing the effect limited to a single ion channel. No one was checking what happens if you put everything together. Okay? So we set up a model in which we have a neuron, a CO1 neuron in this case. We spread up with a bunch of synapses. And we modeled uh, Alzheimer by just uh, uh, implementing those changes randomly on different pieces of membrane, taking out uh, 30% of a membrane or 90% of a membrane to model the progression, progression of the disease. Okay? And once we do that, we can implement a model of Alzheimer. And now this, this is now a live simulation. Let me arrange everything so you can see what's going on here. Okay, so we have a neuron which is doing its stuff, random background synaptic activity you will see that there's going to be uh, some activity here and there. This is the space plot, which tell, is telling me what is it, it is going on along a path uh, along the, this dendrite. And you see there is a background activity. Occasionally, there is a spike in the, in the dendrites that uh, goes to the soma. So now, what happens during Alzheimer? During Alzheimer, yes? No, there is no stimulation here. This is are the synapses which are activated randomly. Okay. So they are uniform distribution. No, there, there are those are yes, uniform distribution. Yes, okay. random, okay. random distribution of fifty synapses in the okay. neuron. So there is no input. There is no external input. And they are all excitatory. Yes. Yeah? Yes, yes. This is just an example. I mean, just yeah. to show what happens if we apply all the changes that have been shown up for the for ion channels experimentally during Alzheimer's. If we do this, we see that the neuron, as expected, would reduce its firing, okay? Because you reduce the, the channels, the plaques are going to, to, to interfere with the normal generation of action potential, and the neuron basically stops firing, okay? But once we have a model, we can also try to figure out a way to rescue to the normal conditions by applying some pharmacological manipulation to some of the currents, okay? And when we do this, and we did it on, with the KA, so simulating KA treatment, the neuron goes back to the normal condition. Okay, so in this way we can study the effect of Alzheimer, but also test possible uh, pharmacological treatments and, and things like that. This is one example in which a single neuron may be, single neuron simulation may be important because this can run on my laptop. A network, when, when I want, if I want to model cognitive function, cannot run on my laptop. I need much larger allocation. The other case is, for um, field potentials, external field. So you, you have been following probably the over and over again um, uh, problem issue of figuring out if the um, external electrical noise in the um, environment is a problem for the brain or not, okay? And it has not been clearly decided yet. There are no clearly experimental um, uh, data showing that there is an effect. And I'm talking about uh, 
um, power lines. I mean, power, power, power frequency, okay? means 50, 60 hertz, and not going up around the, or talking about the cell phones, because the cell phones are using a, a frequency that is too high to enter the, the, the brain. It, it cannot pass the skull, okay? But the uh, 50 hertz, it goes through. And it happens to be that the 50 hertz is the same, or the, the 20 millisecond cycle, is the same of the membrane time constant of hippocampal neurons. So the hippocampal neurons are going to resonate to the 50 hertz. So it is important to study what is the effect at the single neural level. So, and uh, um, as you can see here, even if the European Union recommends 10 kilowatt per meter as the limit of exposure to the, to the low frequency electromagnetic fields, close to power pillars, this is okay, okay? But if you go also for electrical appliances, like the induction hob, you know, if you, if you look at the the master chef or all these food uh, contests in which they use the uh, induction knob, I mean, these, these things uh, have five times higher emission with respect to what is suggested by EU as a limit. Of course, I don't expect that the guy goes there, here on the, on the Dutch room and does that, because those, those are hot spots, okay? But still, it is five times higher. The food processor, the very simple food processor, is a 40,000. The planner 24, the energy, okay, again, you don't go too close to those things. But there are electrical noises in the, at the power uh, lines uh, frequency, which can sum up in some cases. Okay, so what is the effect on the neuron? Okay, we can do a simulation. I will explain you the, 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 the plot here, but let me run the simulation. Okay, so in this simulation, we have the extracellular field, the direction of the field, that in this, in this case is a planar field that goes from the top to the, to the, 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 the bottom of the, of the neuron. This is a C1 neuron, and this is the somatic activity. Let me extend this here. And let's run again the simulation. This, this is going to have the neuron going uh, um, sub-threshold activity for, for about 100 milliseconds with no spikes, and it is flowing out around. And uh, at 100 milliseconds, I um, turn on the, the field. I think it is five kilo, kilovolts per, per meter. <coughs> and you see how the neuron is going to reply to the external field. There it is. Okay? Yes? How do you set up this to test this idea in this neuron environment? Uh, I do implement the simulation, you mean? What do you mean the setup? Hmm. I mean setup. I mean you. Uh, and not like the input parameters to run this. Uh, yeah, you have the idea that drill impacts something. Yes. Right? I have how do you set up this? How do you bring this, this idea to neuron? Okay. Package? Yes. The idea is that uh, whenever I can model with an equation or a set of equations. I can plug these equations into the additional equations that uh, are used to make up the neuron. So I start with the neuron under physiological conditions with all the equations for ion channels, so that, I mean the sodium, the different type of potassium channels, the calcium, and so on. And so I have a, a neuron which is reproducing more or less the experimental features. Then suppose that I want to model Alzheimer. I just apply the changes that the experiments tell me uh, um, as a result of Alzheimer's, so reduction in the peak conductances. In this case, for the electrical field, it is just one equation, because the field is a perturbation of the membrane potential. Okay? But since the field is uh, affecting, is the, the, the field is dependent on the distance, every compartment in the neuron is different in terms of effect of the external field, okay? And so the equation is going to be uh, with a, with a, uh, contribute to a different amount throughout the dendrite, according to where the field is. In fact, if I rotate the field in this direction, for example, the effect on the neuron is completely different. So the idea is that as, as long as you have the equation that describes the features that you want to model, yes, you so can that, put that equation. Yeah, so that was the question, how, how do, you, do you write this equation, if you don't know? Well, if you, you need to know, 
uh, yes, you need, uh, we are go back to the original question. You need to know what you, what you are doing, okay? So this is the reason for, for writing a paper. <laughs> okay, so if you have a question that you want to explore scientifically, you need to have the background to, to know what, how to uh, implement or how to make hypotheses and then make a real construction in terms of equation that you want to test in the, in the model. So for example, if you want to model, um, I don't know, what is your, the problem that you have in mind? No problem yet? <laughs> okay, so I can give you plenty of problems. <laughs> okay, so if you want to model epilepsy, you need to make some hypothesis based on the experimental data. If the experimental data, or for example, a, a doctor uh, several years ago came to me um, and said, okay, look, I'm, I have a baby which has um, neonatal febrile seizures, the epileptic of the babies, you know, the, te the, 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 uh, the temperature raises and they go on the convulsion. And uh, he found that uh, that baby had um, a, a channel mutation in the CA1 region, the KM, one of the potassium channels. And he told me, if I give you the kinetics of the control conditions and the mutated channels, can you implement the model? I said, yes, give me the data and I implement the model. So we did the model and uh, we figured out, we found that if you change the kinetic of that specific channel, the neuron becomes much more excitable. And so this is the reason for having more easily uh, seizures rather than not, related directly to a mutation of a KM channels. But for each the particular um, problem, you need to hypothesize something or, or have some specific data that tells you how to modify the equation that you are implementing, uh, that you are implementing with, okay? So in this case, I mean, you see that uh, if I move, rotate the electric field, the neuron is going to spike much less. It means that the direction of the field with respect to the, the, the neuron princi principal axis is going to affect the behavior of the neuron. So that if the neuron is perfectly aligned with the field, you are going to be affected. Otherwise, you don't. And Frequency because you yes. mentioned the uh, resonance uh, principle. Yeah. So have you also sweep the frequency and have you observed this phenomenon? Well, they are going to be reduced. If I increase the but in this paper we were interested only in the 50 hertz yes. because it is the power line. But if we change the frequency of the of the field, it's going to be uh, also some effect at the level of the neuron. It's going to be less and less uh, affected because high frequency are going to not going through the they don't generate much, um, much depolarization in the neuron mm -hmm. because the membrane is so slow that it can basically dampen out all the high frequency oscillations. Mm -hmm. Okay? Thank you. So, so, so the, if we decrease the frequency of the oscillation of 20 hertz, it will, so it will, it will change. change? Yeah, it will change. Okay. So it's all independent? Yes, the yes. So basically what you're seeing here is that what you're suggesting from the model is that uh, um, since it strongly depends on the alignment between the field and the principal axis of the neuron, and the hippocampus is in 3D, very few neurons would be affected by this at any given time, okay? Because if you move your head, you go around, you, I mean, you are going, not going to affect, to affect a lot of neurons, okay? However, if you live close to a power pillar or close to a large generator of electric fields, and you study something, you memorize something. You are memorizing something using a set of spikes because, you know, spike time dependent plasticity rules because of the, of the spike time is, is important to, uh, to, to uh, potentiate or depress the, 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 the synapses. If we run the same simulation as, uh, I mean, this, these are raster plots. I assume that you all know what a raster plot is. Uh, so you have this series of spikes. We are replaying CA3 input on CA1 neuron. So we, we got experimental data recording from CA3, which is the region giving most of the input to CA1. And we play this for different trials on our neuron. And then we apply the electrical field. And these are some differences. In general, you don't see much. But in many cases, you see that the electrical field 
is going to generate more spikes or to change a little bit the spike that is already there. So in this case, for example, without field, you get only one spike. With the field, you get, uh, in this, during one second, three spikes, and so on. It means that if you learn something with a given pattern, then under, under electrical field conditions, and then you move away, you change home in a very bucolic arrangement, you are going probably not recognize well or not, not re re recalling well something that you learn under the field because your spike sequence is different. Okay? Only in very specific cases. I'm not saying that this is widespread. Okay? But there may be cases in which it is important. Okay, so that said, how we do it? As Rosanna told you, we start from the traces. In this case, there's, those are uh, CA3 neurons, again from the hippocampus, but uh, from a population that uh, is feeding inputs to the CA1. It doesn't matter from, that, from this point of view because the workflow is always the same. We start from the traces, okay? In this case, if we have a CA3 neuron. This is the morphology reconstruction. These are some pictures uh, that, the, that the experimentals gave, gave, gave us. And these are different traces showing that the same population of neuron, CA3B neuron, under the same input current can generate different patterns, completely different patterns. Those are uh, recordings from not the same, but different neurons in the same population. Okay? And you can have uh, non-adapting or weakly adapting, delayed, bursting, adapting. So how we are going to, to model this and why? Okay? So we went on and said, okay, let's start from C1 neurons. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit delayed for this, okay? Um, let's start from uh, the set of CA1 neurons, because this, is a, this was a new neuron type for us, CA3 instead of CA1, amygdala rather than cortex, rather than basal ganglia, in this case CA3 instead of CA1. They are different in, th in their morphology and their um, electrophysiological features. But we don't have any channel kinetics specific for the CA3. The experimentalist, every time I asked for um, more specific, who is, uh, who is doing experiments here, electrophysiological? Okay, every time I ask one of you guys to give me the kinetics of a specific uh, um, uh, neuron, you say, nah, I'm not going to do this because you cannot publish on nature or science. These data are very fundamental data, very helpful data, but they are not fashionable from this point of view. So we don't have CA3 channels, so we start from CA1 channels, okay? Sodium, KDR, and KA, these are the basic channels that you see above observed in CA1. So we start from those, and we're trying to run a simulation. We're using only, only those channels on, uh, uh, to check what's going on with our uh, model. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so these are typical experimental data, the one that you saw before. And we want to model this. Let's start from this, which is the, the simplest one. Because we, why it is the simplest one? Because it is a simple train of action potential with very little difference between um, one spike and the other. Just a little bit of increase in the timing. Okay? So from our point of view, it's the simplest one. Those with the burst, these are the most difficult. Because as you can imagine, this is a very highly involved uh, dynamics going on between all channels. But this is the simplest one. So we thought, okay, <coughs> we can go ahead with the channels from CA1. And this is the result. We cannot go as doing manually, not optimization as you see that, that later. Since I know what I'm doing, I just try want to, to change manually, it's following my instinct the different conductances. And I cannot go better than this. Of course, this is wrong, okay? Because uh, the, uh, the, the threshold for the action potential is too low. But this is so in the experiments. The threshold for action potential for CA1 neurons is much lower than the one for CA3B, which is everything sh shifted up. And there is no way that I can change the conductance here to reach a threshold of uh, uh, minus 30. Okay? I'm not going into details of why I cannot do this, but basically, if I 
need to reach this threshold, the sodium channels inactivates. And so I cannot get an action potential. So the hypothesis here is that the channels in CA3 are shifted by 25 millivolts all at once. And in fact, if I shift all the, all the, all the um, channels by 25 millivolts, you see that now I have this trace here, which is much closer. Let me delete the previous one. Yes, both cases. In this case, I did it manually because I have an intuition of how the different channels works. But uh, do you, if you know, I mean, the optimization program needs your input in terms of what it needs to change. Okay? So if you say, okay, in my opinion, the shift is important. So you put the shift as a parameter in your optimization, and the optimizing program is going to check also for different shifts. But if you don't do it from the beginning, the program is not going to, 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 to suggest you this. So this is important, a very important point. Yes, but the shift in the kinetics. The shift in the kinetics, which means also the, the, the voltage at which the sodium channels become explosive, mm -hmm. okay. Okay? which is different in CA3 and CA1, mm -hmm. according to the experiments. OK, so let's go do, do the, to the uh, more complicated stuff, adaptation. Okay? In this case, it is clear that something is going on because I have this spike, then the next spike very close, and then a lot to delay, and then even more delay. Okay? So I cannot go ahead. If I look at the kinetics, let me let me if I do look at the kinetics, you see that the time constant for the kinetics is around 10 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, 12 milliseconds. It, it is this red uh, uh, red uh, axis here. So all the channels have a dynamics which is much faster than the delay that I'm seeing here. You re realize that. So after at most 30 milliseconds, the channels are back to their sta resting state, original conditions when they got here. So there is no way in which there is this kind of additional delay. There must be, what is, what, what is the hypothesis? The hypothesis is that there I must have some additional mechanism going on there which is affecting the interspike interval. Which means, in my world, I need a an ion channel kinetic with a much larger time constant. Okay? And this is done with the so-called M channel, the muscarinic channel, potassium channel, which has at the physiological conditions as a, as a time constant of about 200 milliseconds. So this can help because what happens is if you start from resting potential and you, do an action, you have an action potential which brings the membrane potential to here to plus 30, you go from here almost instantaneously to here. All the channels kinetics are trying to follow this sudden change in the, in the membrane potential. But they can't. Most of them, sodium and potassium Ka and KDR, can make some step toward the, the new condition at 30 millivolts. But the Km is too slow, so it just changes its activation time, its activation um, um, uh, range from here to here. Because in one millisecond, the action potential goes here and then here. In this one millisecond time, the, the ion channels looks through all the, 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 its activation curve with a very slow uh, change. It means that after the first action potential, it goes back, the, the KM channel 
is going not to have enough time to go back to its original activation state. It will stay open a little bit. With the, and this means, since it is a potassium channel, that you have an additional driving force to minus 80, which is going to delay the spike. Okay? With the, another spike, it's going to activate a little bit more, and so you have this kind of memory effect, which is uh, able to generate the delay that you see in the spikes. So, let's run the simulation again. <coughs> and now we have the adaptation and the adaptation with KM. So if I adjust the conductance, the best I can the best I can do no strong adaptation. This is another simulation. Let me delete this. Strong adaptation with KM is this. The best I can get is this tells me that Km is not enough, okay? Because I'm missing this very long delay. Of course, there is another mechanism, which is on top of the Km, which is able to even delay even more than the, the spike, okay? Yes? So when you're saying you, the best you can get is this, you just manually the parameters yes. to see what happens. There's yes. No, like no, 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 this is this I done it manually. In principle, it could be some, but my intuition was that I'm, I, I'm much better than any optimization so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. After 40 years of this job, I know much better than any program. Okay. So this is the best I can do. There is another channel that is already, or, um, uh, already present in CA3, but in all neurons, which are calcium channels. And whenever there is calcium channels, there are also potassium, calcium-dependent potassium channels, okay? So if I add calcium-dependent potassium channels and calcium channels, okay, let me delete this. Oh, one additional thing. If I do, if I add only potassium, calcium-dependent potassium channels, the best I can get is this. And this is, of course, what is going on here? Uh, you have action potential, some calcium entry, some potassium dependent uh, calcium that uh, uh, reply, open a little bit. Calcium entry, calcium entry, and you see that you begin to see the delay. But when the delay is about 100 milliseconds, which is of the order of the calcium pump extrusion, so the calcium enters the cell, but then is um, um, pushed out of the cell by the pumping mechanism. So the calcium decays, and then you have a spike. So this cannot be the reason to, for having these long delays. But if I put both back together, Km and the uh, uh, calcium-dependent potassium channels, I can get to this point. Oh, not to this point, of course. So adaptation. Visitor effect. This. Okay, let me see. <laughs> this is crazy, but it is almost. Okay. Look at these spikes 100, almost 200, or 400. Okay. Now I'm going to raise this and do the, this. You see that now I am very close, which means that I need both. Okay. And the same with the bursting. With the bursting, I don't know what's going on here. That's, of course, something that is very. I can also get a very close uh, bursting very close to the experiments. Okay, by manipulating just the conductances, and of course after shifting by 24 millivolts of the channels. Mm -hmm. So at this point, what I did was what we did was. Okay, we have all these conductances. Uh, we know that there are millions of combinations of conductances. So I've just tested the one that was okay for our purpose. But I'm almost sure that uh, if I manipulate a little bit of the conductance, I can find many cases in which I have a set of conductances which gives me a good reproduction of the experimental data. 
So we went through, and at this point I need a, a small supercomputer, a small allocation of supercomputer, and uh, did a simulation in which we uh, tested all possible current injection with all possible combination of, uh, of conductances. Uh, and uh, classify automatically the result in such a way that we can uh, figure out what uh, was the best combination of conductances having, for having a burst, having a, an adapting traces, and so on. And so you can see here the different things going on, the classification algorithm that says this is a burst, this is not. Of course, some traces are going to be ugly, but don't tell me, you experimentalists, that don't you get ugly traces in your experiment. Okay, so <laughs> the model is doing the same. So uh, let me stop here just, just to see. So, for example, yeah. Is the model generally assume a constant concentration of exercises? Yes. Calcium, yes. The concentration of, well, uh, this is a very good point. Um, based on, uh, on the, what is known about uh, the inside the outside concentration of ions, uh, the, resting, uh, the, 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 the vessel potential for sodium and potassium are kept fixed. The calcium is not. The calcium depends on the calcium input. So we have the Ogin um, Goldman Katz equation for the, for the reversal potential of calcium in these simulations, in these files that I'm using, but not for sodium and potassium. And so you see, yeah, there are traces. I want to check one for ugly trace. Well, for example, this was defined as, let's see, how did the non-adapting? Yeah, OK. So now we have a, a set of conductances. And what is the result? We can set, um, put everything together and analyze the results to see what are the conductances most affecting each different condition. OK, delayed. Of course, if you have a delayed trace, which means that a normal behavior after a delay, an initial delay, you need the so-called decurrent. And this is, of course, important because the decurrent is expressed. It has been shown that there is another potassium current with features, kinetic features, that are needed for this kind of behavior. Adapting. The adapting cells needs to have both Km and calcium-dependent potassium channels, but in 95% of the cases, the calcium-dependent potassium channels was higher than the Km. The opposite for bursting. Okay, So we actually can, with this model, we can predict the channel distribution or expression in any CA3 B neuron by looking at the trace. If a trace is a bursting, then the Kn, the potassium dependent, the calcium dependent potassium channel must be um, um, lower than Km. They are need both for, for this kind of behavior because you see that uh, neither, there were no simulations in which we can reproduce this data with, the, with, the, with the some, any of the, those two. Okay? Okay, so just a quickly going through this. This effect in which you have uh, <coughs> many possible different sets of conductances reproducing equally well a set of experimental traces. It, it is a very well-known effect in biology. It's called degeneracy. Okay? And this is important because a neuron cannot, I mean, if you record from uh, different neurons, even if they have uh, very uh, similar traces, they are not going to have the same conductances. Okay? Because conductances are dynamically changed with the neuron activity. So, for example, they, they, um, um, uh, phosphorylation processes are going to change the, the density of channels. I mean, you, you tell me that there are a lot of biochemical activity that are going to change the density of channels in any given neuron based on their uh, past activity. Okay? So, how come that uh, you have so many different combinations of uh, conductances that works and uh, why, OK? So uh, basically, the, the reason is that uh, the system overall must be robust enough to adapt to any changing condition, OK? So we tested this for C1 neuron. And in this case, we use the tools that you are going to see later the, 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 in, the, in the talks. So we start from a bunch of morphologies for interneurons and the pyramidal neurons, of course, 
um, from uh, good experimentalists, which gave us three-dimensional reconstructions for or different, uh, or different morphologies. And of course, we start also from traces, some of which we, you, you saw with, uh, with uh, um, Rosanna. Uh, traces from, I mean, 50, almost 1,500 experimental traces, and we extract from them 107 physiological features. So we are going to see later the use case that we use to, to extract this, these features automatically from a, from a bunch of traces. And with those features, we implement the model because we had the morphology, we had the channel kinetics from my previous uh, CA1 uh, um, models, we had the feature extraction, so we had, the, uh, we had all the, the, the experimental data that we need to implement and run automatically the optimization. And uh, you see that uh, in many cases the, 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 um, the experiments uh, uh, looks like very similar to the, to the models, including the prediction, yes. Yeah. With some simple representation like bolent stick of apical and basal dendrites, then uh, how it will change I mean, qualitatively uh, in comparison to real morphology? I just want to. Yes, that. yes. Uh, we did not check this because we are we're not interested in doing reducing, uh, re reducing model. My guess is that uh, you are going to get uh, still good results, but a co with a completely different set of conductances. Yes, yes, yes. However, if you fix the conductances, which are good for one morphology, and you change the morphology, you know, mm -hmm. you have the conductances and the morphology, yeah. you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to check this exactly set of conductances on another morphology. This does not affect the result, or affect it very little. Okay. And we have a, 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 paper, a figure in the paper. 